we know that there's always a chance. And, you know, death stalks all of us in so many different ways. But to have an incident such as this, even with the timing of the incident, um, it's, it's beyond tragic. It's horrific. Uh, not since the burn execution uh, or attempt at execution of burn um, have we seen something this, this evil. Um, Pat Lynch is throwing gasoline uh, on the flames. I think that he should take time to consider what he's saying. I understand he's a union leader. His job is to promote the welfare and the benefits for his members, but um, this doesn't fall at the feet of City Hall. This is a societal issue. Uh, this man had an extensive criminal history, and he's not a New Yorker. He was not part of anything going on in New York. Um, we know he shot his girlfriend. He drove to New York. He was suicidal. He, had an, he took an attempt on his life a year ago. So there are mental problems, and we have a very violent society, unfortunately. So here it is that things have escalated in that man's life to the point, well, I'm going to kill some cops, but I really want to die. And we generally call it suicide by cop. You know, when you see people come out and do crazy things just so that they can be shot by the police, they really want to die. But in this case, and I've seen it before, cases I've worked on where we had a guy barricaded and he took his own life uh, after killing two people on Nostrand Avenue. So it's, there's a lot, but I wish that Patrick Lynch would consider uh, drawing back from the politics uh, he doesn't make the call as to whether or not the mayor or the police commissioner will be present at the funeral of a deceased member. That is a call that's made by the family. What are you referring to? Uh, he had said a while back, and quite prophetically, he said, if a police officer is shot, they will not be welcome at the funeral. Well, that, that was a reprehensible statement. And... Pat is going to have to, not, I think Commissioner Bratton is going to have to sit down with him and rein him in. Pat Lynch is a member of the New York City Police Department. And to bring adverse criticism against the department is grounds for dismissal. So he will only be a union president as long as he is a member of the police department. He is still a police officer. And I'm sure that Mayor de Blasio is going to sit down with Commissioner Bratton and the three of them are going to have to come to terms, and I think that Pat should bring it down because no one in New York, nobody, my pastor spoke about the offices yesterday in church, and, and Brother Ramos, he had just completed his chaplaincy training. Uh, he goes to a church that's a sister church to my church. He was due to get his certification this week. Um, these are not bad guys. They weren't bad guys. They, they weren't part of the problem. They were part of the solution. Well, Graham, uh, uh, on that note, uh, there's been an attempt, obviously, by some, uh, especially the PBA, to sort of link uh, what happened with Brinsley to the overall protests, as if all of the, pro as if the protesters were protesting against police in general rather than specific practices. Your reaction to this attempt? No, you know, my mother used to call me when something happened. She'd call me up. Well, uh, I said, Mom, I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a chance. I didn't do it. You know, we can't broad brush anybody. Uh, blacks have been broad brushed in this society. Latinos have been broad brushed. Uh, all groups have been broad brushed. And there are some outstanding police officers out there. And, and some of them I, I know personally. You know, and they're not happy about what has transpired with the situation in Staten Island and in other cities because it, it, it casts a dim light on police officers. So um, the death of Eric Garner, uh, we're waiting for the grand jury, all these things. I don't think that the general public in New York City is looking to go into a violence mode. Protest is the right. It's the constitutional right of the people. And we have to remember that. It's not a matter of being policed to the point where you are now under a lockdown by the department, whether it's New York City or any other city, people have the right to protest and make their voice heard to the political entities who are required to set policy and procedures.
We're going to break, then come back to this discussion. Graham Weatherspoon is a retired detective with the New York City Police Department, also board member of the Amadou Diallo Foundation. Amadou Diallo, of course, was the young man who died in a hail of police bullets, 41 to be exact, on February 4th, 1999. Her, his mother, Katiadu Diallo, has formed this foundation. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute. Attitudes, Kronos Quartet. Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We're talking about the aftermath of the killing of two police officers on Saturday, um, what the mayor of New York, Mayor de Blasio, has called an assassination. Our guests are Graham Weatherspoon, retired detective with the New York City Police Department on the board of the Amadou Diallo Foundation, and Stephen Thrasher, weekly columnist for The Guardian U.S. and a doctoral student in American Studies at New York University. Uh, Stephen, uh, talk about the police killing um, and uh, what this means for New York and the country. It's an extremely sad time, obviously, and we've seen a lot of theater leading into this that's, uh, as uh, Detective Witherspoon was saying, is, is putting a lot of fuel on the fire. Uh, just the night before, about uh, less than 24 hours before the shootings happened, I was at a pro-police uh, rally here in New York City, and I've been covering... That was Friday night? Uh, that was Friday evening at City Hall, and I've been covering protests. I was in Ferguson this summer. I've been covering the protests here in the city throughout you know, the past few weeks, and there's been a lot of tension building. There were not many people uh, on the pro-police side, but they were extremely vitriolic, uh, invoking a lot of uh, military imagery and 9-11 imagery and talking about the people who were protesting police brutality as if they were enemy combatants. And you could really tell sort of in this theater, even though it wasn't that many people, that there's already a, there was already a lot of anger at Mayor de Blasio. There's a lot of anger just for letting people exercise their constitutional rights. And, there, and I could tell at that time, this is going to get really ugly if anything actually happens to a police officer, because people were talking about just scuffles with police officers. Were they police officers themselves? There were off-duty police officers. They were mostly uh, members of families, as far as I could tell. Not a lot of people would go on the record with their names. Uh, but there were uh, off-duty officers, and there were many retired officers and family members. There was also a, a, a counter-protest at the same time, wasn't there, on Friday evening? That there was. Some people tried to move on to the bridge, of Brooklyn Bridge? Yes, and, and when the two groups were encountering each other, it was really disheartening because you had almost all non-white people who were against police brutality, and you had almost entirely white people who were there in support of the police, and the uh, the anti-police brutality crowd would say, hands up, don't shoot, and the white people on the other side would respond, hands up, don't loot. And so it was extremely charged language. And uh, they were selling t-shirts? There was a man there who was giving t-shirts away. I don't know if he was selling them or not, but uh, that was the photo I took that, that kind of went viral on Twitter that said, I can breathe. And so you had people who were actually using the uh, dying words of Eric Garner against the anti-police brutality protesters. Saying, I can breathe? Right. I mean, we've, we've, we've gotten used to hearing, I can't breathe, because they were Eric Garner's last words. And of course, that's taken off that people from basketball players to activists of all races around the country have been wearing these I can't breathe shirts. And a man from Colorado said he read a, a story in the New York Post came all the way from Colorado, brought a rolling suitcase full of I can breathe t-shirts and gave them away. And whether or not these people, whether this was officially sanctioned by the Policemen's Benevolent Association, 
Association or not, it was extremely disturbing to see off-duty officers and police supporters wearing these really taunting shirts, and whether or not that statement that was initially uh, attributed to the PBA or not, uh, whether it came from them or not, it's really disturbing to see that this is the level of, of some people in the police department, um, and as the detective was pointing out, you have kind of a civilian insurrection when you have police officers turning their back on the mayor at the hospital, you have the PBA saying the mayor and the protesters have blood on their hands, so it's extremely uh, worrisome and, and disappointing. Uh, Graham, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, I was talking to one of my editors who told me he'd never seen this kind of conflict between uh, civilians and uh, and police. And I said, of course we have. We saw it uh, during the Dinkins era. Uh, in Absolutely. fact, there was a protest of about 10,000 uh, cops that almost turned into a riot at City Hall just at the time that the city council had uh, established a civilian complaint review board. Uh, and uh, there was a really ugly uh, situation there directed against that mayor then. I'm wondering, and you, and you, didn't yes. Mayor Giuliani address the he crowd there and they were talking. The, he, was, yes. he was stirring the pot. This was right. 1992, 1992 and they were saying was, yes. things like uh, calling Dinkins a washroom uh, attendant. Washroom attendants, he wears slick suits, um, all, of, all of those things, you see. And we, we've lost track of the police. Police officers are public servants. Public servants. You don't you can't be a leader unless you're willing to serve. And you, you must be willing to serve the public. But the attitude, there's an us and them attitude that's being projected through the department. And a lot of uh, police officers, I, we had a captain years ago that told officers, well, if you get hurt, it'll most likely be a black or Latino that hurts you, so you have to be careful out there. I killed one already, and I sleep well at night. Uh, we had him removed from his command that day. I called. It was, if I remember correctly, it was uh, Bratton, who was the chief of transit police at that time. We had that captain removed from his command. Um, it, we cannot exist with us and them, uh, a Berba I thou relationship. If there is no we, we will not exist. We will not. The, the gentleman that came all the way from Colorado, same scenario. This gentleman came from Maryland and committed a crime. This other fellow comes from Colorado bringing shirts in here, and he's stirring up a pot. He, he's not a resident of New York, and the police union and the police officers should have, should have had enough intelligence to tell him, listen, that's not what we're about. Put the shirts away and, and go ahead with, with their presentation. I want to turn to former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani, who appeared on Fox and Friends on Sunday. It's certainly true that we have been treated to about three or four months of propaganda about how the police are the enemy, the police are the problem, that there's a major problem between the police and the black community. I call it propaganda because the reality is uh, the, the police interaction with communities is a, is, a, is, a, uh, is a reaction. It's not the cause. The cause is why those police officers were there yesterday. They were moved from one precinct to another because there was more crime in that precinct. They were there to protect the lives, in this particular case, of black people in that neighborhood. And the reality is that the problem here is citizen crime. In, in inner cities, it happens to be black crime. Stephen Thrasher, your response to the former mayor, Giuliani. Of course, I'm, ex I'm always uh, kind of frustrated with Mayor Giuliani. He's also pouring gasoline on this situation, just like uh, Pat Lynch did when he put the letter forward asking people to sign away having the mayor at their hypothetical future funeral. Uh, a big problem is that they're trying to conflate protesters, peaceful protesters, people uh, exercising their constitutional right and saying that they have some kind of culpability for this. And the protesters are not causing police brutality. They're not causing these police deaths. The protests have arisen as a reaction to police brutality. But this is sort of the way that racism works. In Ferguson, we had Darren Wilson, who is not uh, indicted. He doesn't apologize. He says he has nothing on his conscience. He probably was paired, paid a fair amount of money for his interview and probably will make more writing a book and so on and so forth. He doesn't have any culpability. Uh, but racism, I think, in a lot of ways plays out in police interactions that all black people somehow now have to apologize for this crime and all protesters have to 
apologize for this crime. And Mayor Giuliani, of course, has no problem linking the two. And you know, he his own daughter has been arrested for shoplifting and or shoplift. I don't know whether she was arrested or not. I don't think that he would be comfortable with the police、um, reacting to her the way that they would have in other cases. But he he makes it sound like there's no need for a judge or. A